So first of all, I want to thank you guys all for participating in this series of our webinars that we have today. Um, it's a privilege for me to be able to do this talk on uh, building the silage piles because I really feel like the construction and the success that we have in building a silage pile has the biggest impact on the results that our producers have with regards to their livestock performance. So, so Becky, kind of thank, Becky, thanks for uh, for being here today. Let me take a couple minutes and, and introduce you. You know, we're really glad that everyone could um attend our uh, in our virtual silage conference which was originally planned to be held in lincoln in in june or not in lincoln in mead nebraska in june but uh this is hosted by university of nebraska uh lalleman animal nutrition and iowa state university and uh, this is the third of four webinars the next one will be a week from today and galen erickson will be uh, talking about uh, nutrition and management in the current environment with silage diets. So Becky Arnold came on board with Lalleman Animal Nutrition in the fall of 2018 as a territory business manager for Colorado, Kansas, and Arizona. She began her career at DuPont Pioneer representing both dairy and beef operations covering a six state uh, geography that allowed her great exposure to many different silage growing environments and situation. Before joining the Lalamon team, she owned and operated a custom harvesting operation in West Texas that provided harvest consulting services for multiple operation. Her background allows her to understand all the critical components to silage production that have a direct effect on animal performance. She takes a literal in the field approach, evaluating growing crops for quality opportunities and combines her intimate knowledge of the harvesting process to provide solutions and results for livestock producers. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and we're looking forward to what you have to say today, Becky. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. Um, so I've identified a few key topics that I'm going to cover today, which include safety and then preparation, which includes location, ground preparation, capacity, how much space you need. Um, then I've got some examples of some different silage pile footprints that we're going to talk about. We're going to spend a bit of time on pack density because uh, that's a really critical control point for silage quality. We're going to talk about size and shape, which have an impact actually on density pack. And then there's a few other goodies that I have included in here that we're going to go over. So before we jump in, however, I want to talk about safety. And in particular, I want to dedicate my presentation today and honor Dr. Keith Bolson, who we lost a couple of months ago. Um, Keith was not only a dear friend of mine and an amazing silage guru that I could call when I had questions, but he dedicated the later part of his career to keeping all of us silage folks safe. And he and his beloved wife, Ruthie, founded the Keith Bolson Silage Safety Foundation. And Keith in particular had a huge impact on my life uh, around silage safety and keeping me safe. Um, so the five key hazards that Keith identified in his silage safety foundation are a tractor or truck rollover incidents, entanglement or getting run over by equipment, falls from height, being crushed by silage avalanche, and then complacency is always a bit of a challenge around uh, agriculture and silage piles. So my message is just to remind you guys to be continuously mindful of these five and stay alive, go home alive. So before we really dig in, I want to clarify some terminology. Uh, shrink and versus dry matter loss. So shrink is a widely used term in the feed industry, but it can actually be quite deceptive. So shrink is really ton in versus ton out. So if an operation is keeping everything high and tight, this number could be zero if he's just weighing ton in or ton out, but that doesn't really pencil. A silage pile can actually gain one to two points of moisture just from plant cell respiration during the ensiling process. So um, you could actually gain volume or gain actual ton in that silage mass. So what I would prefer to talk about is dry matter or nutrient losses are on the opposite dry matter recovery and nutrient recovery because that's really the meats and potatoes of the silage pile versus what it weighs. So we do know that some nutrients are lost, converted and consumed in the process of fermentation. So 
anywhere from one and a half to six percent, depending upon how efficient the fermentation was. And you can have one percent or more if you have excessive effluent or seepage losses. You've got surface foliage losses of anywhere from three to twenty-four percent, which I know that sounds like a crazy number, but if you think about that whole top of your silage pile is your largest area of vulnerability, it's the most amount of surface area that you have, and it's less packed. And then you can have feed out losses of anywhere from one to 15%, depending upon um, your feed out management practices. So um, the average well managed silage pile is 15% dry matter loss. Something I'd like for you guys to keep in mind is a ton of good feed weighs the same as a ton of bad feed, but they're not going to make mill or muscle rate of gain the same. So uh, we're going to jump in now, um, now that we've clarified all of that stuff. So you guys strap in. We've got quite a bit to cover and I'm going to go kind of fast. So the first thing to consider when building a silage pile is going to be location. If you have the option or the luxury of deciding where you're going to put it. And the first thing you want to consider is drainage. You want to make sure that you have an elevation location that allows rain, snow, and seepage to drain away from the pile rather than towards it. Um, if you have a well on property, you want to put your pile far enough away from the well that you can avoid any seepage contamination into the well. Effluent is actually one of the most highly corrosive uh, properties on your farm. Um, so, and it can also pose some environmental issues if it's not managed properly. Um, you want to consider weather event patterns so that you don't locate your pile where snow may drift and limit your access. You also want to consider your feeder location. So locate the pile where the feed pad or commodity area is so that you can maximize feed operator efficiency. Their time equals your money. Um, and you also want to reduce equipment travel wear and tear from having to travel a long distance to get to the silage pile. Uh, I always look at what direction a silage a silage face is open. I try to plan silage piles so that the face will be away from high levels of radiant heat exposure. So, for example, Colorado, Kansas, if you have a south open face, then you have the sun just beating down on that face all day. Or open to the west, you have the more intense heat on that west side. So, if you have the opportunity to consider where you're going to open the silage that is advisable. And then maneuvering space. Don't underestimate how much space or buffer you need to have around that pile in order to get a proper build and path. So um, a minimum for me, I would say 12 feet buffer, but I prefer a 15 foot buffer. This gives your tractors room enough to pull off the pile and, and go over the pile from any direction without bumping into any obstacles. Next, we have ground preparation, and this is the step that I see missed quite a lot unless we have a concrete or asphalt pad, which would be most ideal. Um, asphalt can be poured for lower costs, but um, it, and it holds up really well to silage acids, but it's not as durable as concrete. Concrete, concrete is very durable, especially in high traffic, but um, it, it can be degraded by silage acids. More often than not, we have unpaved paved surfaces like recycled concrete material, fly ash makes a pretty good base. But regardless of your unpaved surface, and this is where I really like some ground preparation, um, those unpaved surfaces can become muddy and rutted out at different times of the year, especially where drainage is inadequate. Um, so do what you can to prep the ground so you don't have inadequate drainage. And uh, you also want to be mindful of large parts particle size rocks that end up in the mixing equipment and cause you unnecessary wear and tear. And then the last reminder on that note is that dirt and rocks are not nutrients. They don't make muscle or milk. So one question is how much space do you actually need? Sometimes you only have one option and um, so that's what you're stuck with. And if that's the case, I'd like you to consider two things. First of all, a higher density pack will allow you to fit more silage into a given space than lesser density pack. Also, if you cannot construct a pile that is both safe and properly sized to fit into this space, consider a second pile at a nearby location, which we'll dive into in a little bit. If you do have the luxury of size planning, there are several tools that are available to you. There's some calculators online by Brian Holmes or Ken Barnett. 
or Lalamond has this calculator um, that I really like to use. It gives you the opportunity to enter. So all of those white boxes that you have right there, you can enter your variables in. So tons to be harvested. Next is going to be your target dry matter. You've got your target density pack. You've got your slopes that you can put in for your uh, front and back ramp and your side slopes. Uh, we recommend a three to one or four to one to be the most safe. Um, then you've got your max height, which the maximum amount of height that you can get for a given uh, slope doesn't necessarily mean it's a safe height. So um, that's something that takes some extra thought. And then you can enter your base width because you know what your width is. And then this calculator is going to give you all of the rest of the information that you need. So. For this 25,000 ton pile that's 200 wide and I put it at 18 high, we need to be 500 feet long. And it also gives me great information here about what uh, tonnage I have in my different ramps. So there's different calculators that you can use to figure out what space you need. There's also this quick down and dirty calculation that I use all the time on the fly in the field. Um, which is your length times width time width times height, and then you multiply that by your density pack, and then divide by 2,000 to get your tons of as fed. The height is a little bit tricky. You can't multiply by your peak height. You have to figure out what your average height is across that silage pile. So um, capacity that can be improved by density in a given footprint. So, as I said a couple of slides ago, you can fit more in densely packed than less densely packed. So, here's an example of a 200 wide by 400 long. The max height on this I went was 25, so my average ended up being about 16 feet high. So, at 12 pounds per cubic foot of dry matter density, we have 23,500 23, ton in there. Going all the way up to 20 pounds per cubic foot, uh, we go up to 39,000 tons. So in that same footprint, you can fit 40% more feed by really um, amping up your density pack. Besides the quality and dry matter recovery that it provides you, it's good use of your space. So here's some examples of width and height that I calculated out or mapped out at different scales with a three to one slope. So for this 18, for this 80 foot, you can go up to 13. This is your slope. And then 120 feet wide, you can go up to 20 feet. Coming over here to the right where we've got our bigger piles, 200 feet wide or 400 feet wide, you can certainly go higher. You can go up to 35 feet on this 200 foot wide pile, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's safe because equipment not, can't necessarily reach up that high. So a lot of times what you'll do is you'll just kind of level it off right here and you wanna have a little bit of a dome so that you have enough of a diversion that you can have water run off of the silage pile. But um, this is a good indication to give you an idea of what that height should be and it's really um, easy to calculate yourself on a scale just get some graph paper and you've got um, over three up one for a three to one slope so now we're going to jump into density pack which is my favorite part of all of this there's several factors that influence density pack um, it's directly related to feed quality and feed conversion. So improving your density pack begins with understanding the factors that influence it. There's probably more than these, but your rate of delivery is a big deal. Um, your moisture content is also a big deal. Um, particle size and chop length, layer thickness is uh, my absolute soapbox that I stand on. Um, slope, your um, length of your fill ramp, your wall height, tractor weight and tire width and pressure, how many tractors you have, how fast those tractors are go, and last and really, really critical is the pack operator. And why this is so critical is it's kind of an industry standard that we put our new guys in the pack tractor, which um, I understand we don't wanna necessarily have our new guys running the chopper, our three quarter of a million dollar piece of equipment, but, um, the job that he's doing on the pack tractor, in my opinion, is a lot more critical. 
Each factor alone may be of little impact, but combining as many of these variables together as possible is really going to be the key to getting your density pack where you want it to be. So, and it starts with the first load. So spreading out the very, very, very first load thin and then building upon that. I've been in a lot of situations where guys will dump however many trucks wide they're gonna, they're gonna have their pile be. And then those, let's say that there's five trucks wide that this pile is gonna be, and then they kind of spread those out and then they start building the pile on top of that. Well, we're building a pile on top of basically an air mass. There's air that's trapped inside of those, those loads that they didn't get spread out initially. And you're already starting up a couple of steps behind par. So density pack being directly related to dry matter loss, Kurt Ruppel, which is a pretty common name that you'll hear around silage land, uh, studied the effects of bunker density in relation to uh, dry matter losses. So these dry matter losses are what was calculated at 180 days of ensiling at these different density measurements. So in short, you can kind of figure that one pound per cubic foot increase in density is going to result in 1% of dry matter recovery. So what does that really mean though? So to take that a little bit further, I've taken those predict predicted dry matter losses, calculated the value of those losses, against $45 per ton in the pit uh, silage price. That's about where it was last year. And I think that's pretty close to where we're gonna land this year. So to give you an idea of this, to improve your density pack from 13 pounds per cubic foot to, to 15 pounds per cubic foot is worth 77 cents a ton in that dry matter nutrient value, which you take that to a 50,000 ton pile that you're putting up and that's $38,500 Yet that you've either gained or lost um, in, in achieving or losing that density pack. So um, that's pretty impactful if you, if you put it into those kind of terms. So here we go, we get to talk about layer thickness. So density pack related to layer thickness. The thicker the layer in inches, the less the density pack. So if you look at six versus eight inches right here, this is your 70 cent, 77 cents, guys. You've got 15 pounds per cubic foot with a six inch layer, and you've got 13 pounds per cubic foot with an eight inch layer. So putting out thin layers is, is critically important. Density decreases as layer thickness increases, as you can see from this chart. There's a positive correlation with packing time, packing weight, and dry matter content. As each one increases, density also increases. However, if we're gonna talk about density, we also have to talk about porosity. So here's an example of a 30% dry matter uh, sample with a density of 15 pounds per cubic foot. By increasing that density to, uh, or by, by the changing the dry matter to 34%, now we have 17 pounds per cubic foot. So dry matter density does not account for the porosity, which are the voids of space between particles. It's either gonna be filled with water or it's gonna be filled with air, which allows gases to move within the material, so primarily oxygen. So looking at that same 30% dry matter sample packed at 15 per pound, pounds per cubic foot, it contains roughly 35 pounds in that cubic foot of water and 30% in that cubic foot is gas-filled porosity. If we have a 40% dry matter sample that's still packed at 15 pounds per cubic foot density, we've got 22.5 pounds of water in that cubic foot and almost 50% of that cubic foot is filled with gas porosity. So 67% gas is gonna flow 67% faster through a 40% dry matter sample or pile versus a 30% dry matter. So if we're gonna talk density, we also have to consider porosity. So pack layer thick up effect on porosity is the obvious, uh, obvious opposite of pack layer thickness, thickness on density. As pack layer thickness increases, silage porosity increases. The higher porosity, the higher dry matter losses due to aerobic deterioration. As porosity increases, dry matter content increases for the same density. That's that calculator that we just, that example that just we just went through. So when I'm talking about six inch layers, um, and you can't always tell 
from inside the cab of a pack, pack tractor because there's you're quite high off the ground. But if you are standing on the ground and you're looking at this, this picture that I have right here is what I mean by six inch layers. I don't ever want to see the blade lift up off of the of the silage surface beyond that six inches. If you get to where you're having to lift your blade up so that you can unload the rest of your load, then you've taken too big of a load. And what ends up happening is this right here. So you lift up your blade, this gets dropped on, and I guarantee another load's going to come up here, and that's not that's that's a section that's just not going to get packed. So I want you to consider how much material you can take in a blade load to be able to feather it off in a six inch layer. And that is directly related to how much runway you have to deliver that load. If you have a really long, long runway that you can take a full blade load and feather it off that entire fill ramp, then go for it. But if you have a short runway and you take a full blade load, well, here's, here's where a lot of that is gonna end up. And this is a lot of where we lose density pack. So we also have a uh, packing weight related to rate of delivery. So the weight's supposed to smush down all of those layers that we've put on. Um, but what is that packing weight that we need to accomplish that? And I'm sure many of you have heard of the 800 rule, but we'll just go through it real quick. Um, choppers are getting big, bigger and beefier. Uh, the new John Deere 9000 touts that it can pull in 400 ton per hour. The class 900 series, 380 ton per hour. I know that that's pretty excessive. Um, you got to be really clicking and having like a truck under you all the time, never stopping, like a big, huge pivot that you don't have to stop kind of a situation to be clicking those kinds of tonnage, but it's not unrealistic. So I used 340 ton per hour for this 800 rule calculator. You multiply it by 800, and now this gives you what your pounds are that you need divided by 2000 to get your tons. We need 136 tons of heavy metal to handle that 340 tons per hour that's being delivered. If our average tractor weight is 45, that's three tractors that we need for that one chopper that's bringing in 340. And I would bet that you guys work with operations that are running more than one chopper. So if we have two of those bad boys, that's six tractors that we need to have on that pile in order to accommodate this this packing weight uh, guideline. I don't know that that's always uh, realistic. We sometimes have spatial limitations where we don't have room to put that many tractors on, or maybe we just don't have that much equipment available to us. So I'm going to defer back to having the opportunity to put out thin layers. So six inch layers is what's gonna, is what's gonna make it for you. If you are having trucks that are coming in so hot that you, uh, can't keep up on the base. I am absolutely down for slowing trucks, um, holding them up for a second so that your pack tractors can get caught up on the face. And I'm not talking about talk, stopping trucks for 10 minutes. If you stop a truck for two minutes, maybe three minutes at the most, that's usually enough time for guys to get caught up on the face. But it's important to keep control of that all the way through. Don't don't ever get behind or you've got um, it's kind of a snowball effect that happens if guys get behind. So I'm going to switch gears here and show you a quick video. Okay, so watch these this tractor that's coming off of the or that that came onto the pile. He's coming around right now. So the one that's on the pile right now is on the pile for approximately 20 seconds, if you can see my little timer on the bottom. So here we're at 20 seconds and he comes off. And I love this, I see it all the time. It kind of makes me crazy, but um, here we're taking a nice wide swath around invisible trucks that are not there um, and squaring up to a pile that's not there to push. I have no idea why he's coming around and taking such a big swath at this, but what it ends up with, now we're almost done. So we spent, 20 seconds on the pile and 26 seconds off the pile. So I actually evaluated that, uh, that video for about five minutes and what ended up between the two tractors was between 60 and 65% of their time was on the pad, not on the silage pile. So 
that leads me to talk to you about circle packing versus directional packing. I like circle packing from the perspective that it gives you a nice natural shape of your pile. However, I do feel like we get better density pack out of directional packing, which is where you have your push tractors pushing up and then you have other tractors that are just going to the side. So um, that's what these pictures represent. So while I've got trucks unloading over here, I've got these guys that are coming up over the side over on the right hand side. And then as trucks unload over on the right hand side, I'm gonna have my side tractors packing on the left hand side. What also happens with circle packing is as they turn on the pile, there's material that dumps off of the side of the blade, like what you see here, these berms. Those berms almost never ever get packed. Then we have tires that are turning on a silage pile and we have slope related. So on that heavy tractor, on that heavy end of the silage pile, those tires as it's turning are actually digging into layers that we packed beneath. So um, I know that, and I know that this is a technique that's really common. It's also where I see guys spending 60% of their time on the pad and not on the pile because they're circling around versus going up and down. Uh, up and down could be more troublesome for your equipment, could be more wear and tear on your equipment and your transmission. But again, if we are putting guys that are filled with that equipment in the pack tractors um, and just taking care of the equipment, it's of, of much less consequence. So I wanna highlight focusing on packing on the top half of the pile. You can see from these, these two illustrations right here. So here's the bottom end of the pile. In the center, we've got good density pack. On the sides, we're kind of missing a little bit. So this black line is our benchmark of where we wanna be. But up in the top end of the pile, neither of them got there. Neither, none of the top pack in this example got uh, to our benchmark that we wanna do. And then over to the right, here's just another way of looking at this. All of the um, blue that you see is top silage. Almost none of the blue lines make it to the benchmark, whereas most all of the red lines, which is the bottom section of the pile, hit mark with the exception of these little guys over here. So focusing on the top half of the pile for your density pack, thin layers um, is a really important piece to this. And so um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I'm gonna move into shape. Um, there's a few different shapes of piles that guys will do. Um, and this includes whether we're in a bunker or whether we're on a drive over pile, but we've got the progressive wedge, height before length. I think this is kind of your common circle pile builds. This is nice because you can get plastic put on as you progress along. I don't really understand length before height or why anybody would do that. You're leaving a lot of surface area vulnerable while you're building your pile. So our recommendation is a progressive wedge. I think this is the best um, that you have. You have less plant respiration than other fill methods, but you've also, you can see these lines, you've got a nice runway to work with to spread out your thin layers. And yes, you can still cover as you go with this. So this length before height, a lot of guys have seen this YouTube sensation, and I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty impressive to look at. So here's the pros for this kind of length before height. Uh, pile. One, it looks really cool from a drone video. Um, two, it's really efficient for trucks and maneuvering around the silage pile. And then you also have a nice long carpet to spread out thin layers. However, here's some cons that I thought of. You've got lots and lots of tractor travel uh, to get those layers spread out across this in order to keep up with trucks. And then my least favorite part is how vulnerable that whole surface area is. I know that you can see on the end there that they are covering as they go, but I guarantee that this has been exposed to air for quite some time during the construction of it. Um, and in my opinion, somewhat unnecessarily, um, uh, I know that that didn't get built in a day. Okay, so I also think it's important to take pride in your pile shape because you don't wanna have some goofy snuffleupagus looking pile over on the end you know, right next to the highway that everybody's gonna look at um, or for your producers to have to look at for the whole year. Um, but besides having a goofy shape, your height needs to be uniform to accommodate your capacity plan. 
I see a lot these kind of saddleback silage piles where you start off at a certain height and then it dips off and then it comes back up. Um, those are easy to build because when you're right up next to the pile, you can't necessarily tell that you're getting that saddleback effect that's happening. So I think it's important several times a day to get a little distant perspective, pull away from the pile a little bit and look from a distance to make sure that you have a uniform height across there. That is a huge part of being able to fit the amount of silage into that space that we need to. So pile size and slope are not just quality factors, but they're also key factors that are associated with safety. So if you can imagine, and we were talking about this with pile heights a little bit earlier, but if you can imagine a pile that's stacked higher than your equipment can reach, this is absolutely a recipe for a disaster. Um, Steep sides that are more than a 30% slope put pack tractors at risk of rollover. It's difficult to achieve density pack, but you also have tires that are not smushing the plastic up against the silage surface. So this example that you see down here, the tires are tied together, but they're just kind of dangling there. They're not smushing the plastic up against the surface. And so on the surface here, we have this nice layer of crust here. Um, that was originally, or that, that we don't have to have if we had the right slope. You have to have the benefit of gravity to smush the silage up against the surface. If you also think about top spoilage that you see, even though you have it covered and you have tires, those tire grooves that you have when we first build this, then you've got plastic laying across the top of it. We are gonna have a little bit of settling and shrink that's gonna take place. Um, and so that shrink happens, and now we have an air gap here between our plastic and these maybe tire grooves or these openings that we have here. So really being able to smush that, that plastic up against that surface is, is important. And for those of you that have never seen a 45 degree angle silage pile, they do exist. Your steep slope sides are the most uh, dangerous piles that they are because those are the ones that are more prone for silage avalanche. So this quick uh, slide right here is just to give you an indication of what happens between a 30 versus a 40% slope. It just shows you that your center of gravity for your tractor changes and getting up to this 40% slope here is actually putting your tractor at the tip over range. But what's really happening is that there's very little little weight that's happening on this end right here that's actually it's a, it's a pack tractor that's not packing on that steep slope increasing slope decreases packing efficiency so an example here with, with a 20,000 pound tractor it's 20,000 pounds when it's flat but we get up to that 40 percent that we were talking about we've lost 1440 pounds of pack and weight a shallow pile is not super awesome either so over to the left here, you see that we've got a 10.5 degree slope and over to the right an 11.3 degree slope. So um, let's see, I want it, it's not letting me advance again. Okay, oxygen can pen penetrate up to six feet into a surface, um, depending upon how densely packed it is. So what I have in this example are these six fit feet markers of all of this area over here is changing. We're have, it's vulnerable to dry matter loss, but as well as across that entire surface that we have here. Then you have this temperature change that's taking place in these sides. So my core temperature, this is a th three foot probe that I have right here. We've got a 16 degree difference between these sides and the sweet spot here. So what I did is some calculations to see what this means. So this sap pile was 277 feet long and I calculated how much material was in those sides. At these slopes, we've got almost 2000 ton on those slides. If I was to shore up that slope to a 17.5 degree slope, I end up having only 1200 tons on the side. So what I've been able to do by shoring up my sides is I've been able to shove 800 ton into the sweet spot that's not vulnerable to these dry matter losses. We know they're dry matter losses, even though the temperature is, is cooler out here than the sweet spot. The reason why that temperature is cooler is because there's more porosity and oxygen flowing through this space to change that temperature. If oxygen is flowing through that space, 
then naughty bugs are in there consuming dry matter nutrients that we want to save for the cow. But there's this. So this is an awesome shot of what's happening here and showing you your areas of vulnerability. The red that you see on this slide is your sweet spot. This is, oops, this is everything that's safe and secure. Here is all of your area of vulnerability. So here's the sites that have cooled off. Kind of self-explanatory. So thinking outside of the yard, earlier I mentioned that if you don't have the space to put up the right size and shape of a pile to be safe and to maintain quality, I would just like to propose the idea of putting a satellite pile at another location. I realize that this includes logistics and challenges if you have to have a loader over there or um, some of those other considerations, but just food for thought. Um, if you have a less productive corner across the road from your operation, um, this gives you an example of what you can fit there. So this is four and a half, five acre corners that we can put a 200 by 500 foot pile there and fit 24,000 ton or more. I realize that there is a significant expense in expanding the footprint of your storage structure and careful planning is involved. But I do believe that having a safer feed center and higher quality feed um, will outweigh the expense of that. Just food for thought. Okay, so tractor speed is um, another important one. So speed is key. The sooner the silage can be placed and covered, the higher feed quality we recover. But there's many that feel like PAC is not achieved if the equipment is going too fast. I was not able to source any concrete data on what that speed needs to be. But what I do know is that PAC is not achieved if PAC tractors are not able to keep up with truckloads, if they're going so slow that they can't keep up with truckloads. Now your rate of delivery is a factor here. I also know the playing catch up results in many errors that tend to snowball. They'll take too big, a big of a blade load, lose traction, digging into previously packed layers, pushing out too thick of a layer, not packing, not getting a good, a good packing pass over each layer. Um, and then the sides and the edges tend to get forgotten when guys are in the weeds. Um, and density tends to be lighter on the sides anyway. So there's this snowball effect that can take place. How I feel, is I'd rather have a guy go a little bit faster and travel over the silage layers than to be committed to a certain speed. So there's some common sense and some practice involved here. If you're going so fast that you're kicking up material on your tractor tires, then you're going too fast. You don't wanna disrupt layers, um, but you don't necessarily have to crawl. Okay, so now we're getting into some of the other goodies and I had to include this. Um, it was almost comical, except that I take silage really personally. Um, so it was a very windy day, and we all know that there's a lot of dust and dirt that go is involved with harvest, dirt road dust, everything else. Well, we had wind coming from a southeast direction towards the silage pile, and they had trucks unloading on the south side of the silage pile. So here's the part that um, was rocket science. There's absolutely nothing on the north side of the pile. So I had them shift their trucks over to the north side of the pile, and now we don't have all of the dirt that the trucks are disrupting on the pad flowing straight into the silage pile. Okay, I have one more video that I wanna show you. Okay, so what I want you to notice is this carpet um, on the ground. Um, if you are on a dirt pad or um, it's a muddy situation and you don't have a concrete pad, I like the idea of, of having a thin layer of silage right there as a carpet. That's a spot where your trucks can back onto, your tractors can roll on, um, and the tractor tires are not dragging dirt up into the silage pile. And it's also a reminder that your pack tractors don't ever need to scrape their blade along the ground and shove that stuff up into the silage pile. Sometimes I see guys that'll come and scrape along the side of their silage pile because they want to keep it a nice tight line. And then they'll scoop that around to the face and shove that up into the silage pile, all the dirt and trash and rocks and everything that they collected. Um, I would really prefer that 
that doesn't happen. If you want to remove that from the sides, I'm all for it, but let that be on the ground that trucks are going to be going over and have a nice little silage carpet layer um, that protects the, the feed. That just ends up being the base of your silage pile. It's really not critical. It's not critical as much as it is to drag stuff into your silage pile. Okay, so now to track or not to track. I say yes. There is a place for these machines in combination with other four-wheel drive packing tractors. So what I really like is while the true footprint of a track tractor is larger than a tire, their weight is not equally distributed. So there's pressure spikes under the boggy wheels, these guys right here. So compaction actually occurs under the highest contact pressure points, which happens to be under these boggy wheels. Hang on. Um, so at different tire pressures, so 20 PSI, the, uh, the, P the pressure, downward pressure of a tractor is gonna be less than a quad track. At 20 to 35 PSI, it's gonna be equal to one of these quad tracks. And if the tire tr pressure is greater than 35, it's, um, the track has lower contact pressure. So there is a, a way that we can find balance. Um, but even what I really like about these guys is look at that surface. So as you have these tracks that are running along with your pack tractors, I like the idea of having a smooth surface to layer silage over rather than a rutted surface to lay silage layers over. And this track allows you to do that. Plus, um, this really eliminates top spoilage when you put plastic on. Even that tractor right there that is not designed to do any kind of packing, but this is the result of having this on the silage pile to finish it off. There's virtually little opportunity for air gap in between your plastic and um, your silage mass. So you guys have probably seen these before. I won't really drive it home, but there's some principles of compaction. So the heavier load, the deeper the compaction is gonna be. But your, um, your footprint is what makes a big deal. So even, I like the idea of thinner tires. You have, um, with wider tires, you have reduced compaction at a shallower depth, which on a silage pile is really what we're dealing with. So if you consider the difference between a, on your four wheel drives, an 800 wide tractor versus a 710, there's roughly 163 uh, PSI improvement on a 710 versus an 800, just because of this right here, how it reduces your compaction when you're wider. Other packing methods, um, we've got roller machines. The distributed load of roller machines might limit their effect at depth. So I don't think that these are really designed for deep compaction, but similar to the track system that we just talked about, that you have nice smooth layers to be putting your packing layers over, I think is beneficial. Uh, Toad equipment might be a limit, limit, a limit your ability to move backwards and forwards. However, if these are attached to say a three point, you might have a little bit more capability to um, maneuver your, your equipment. I have guys that use these. I can't say that uh, I'm definitely not opposed to them, but I can't see, say that I have witnessed them really bring in the density pack home the way that six inch layers do. Did I mention anything about six inch layers? Okay, other packing methods. I remember when this happened. So this is a customer of mine that was really trying to bring the density pack. And so he rented a vibrating sheep's foot roller. And conceptually, I totally understand the concept. And I think there's probably some people out there that have had some success with it. However, this is what we found. Um, you can see layers of, of mold. You can see layers, big time layers of mold. So these layers of mold were actually happening about every, you know, eight to 10 inches, you could see them. Um, and they were shelving off. And if you notice right here, you can actually see the perforations, the air pockets, this checker mark that you have right here down in this corner, where that sheep's foot basically just made nice little perforated holes for naughty bugs to hang out with. And then we covered it with another layer of silage and then perforated that layer and so on and so forth. 
So um, I wasn't impressed with how this result, how this ended up. So bumpers, bumpers follow the same principles as all of the rest of our packing discussions that we have. You can do the same kind of filling methods. Um, the progressive wedge can take place in a bunker. You actually can achieve really, really, really good density pack in bunkers. The, the limitation is having a guy that is capable of getting up against the wall without uh, destroying things um, and can get those sides packed as well. Um, a rule of thumb with bunkers, however, is along those walls is where you can get a lot of spoilage that happens because weather and water runoff can end up uh, draining down in between the silage mass and the wall. So I love it if guys will make a little silage burrito out of their walls. You line the walls with plastic, fold it over, put your cover on the top, and now there's virtually no way for environmental uh, fluids, water, and things like that to get down in between the wall and your silage mass. Okay, yes, you must. I know there's a lot of guys out there that don't want to put plastic on their silage pile, but I'm going to tell you that um, you really should. Uh, you guys might have seen this data before by from Keith Bolson. Um, this is talking about what's happening in the top 30 inches of your silage pile. So in the third, about 30 inches down, you've lost almost 25% of your dry matter has been lost. In the very top of the unsealed, you've lost roughly 75% of your dry matter value. Versus a sealed pile, you've got 10% that you've lost in the top and less than seven 30 inches down. Pretty huge difference in those numbers. But it's not just dry matter loss that we have, we also have digestibility losses. So looking here, uh, Keith Bolson did some research in 99 looking at the effect of spoiled corn silage on beef intake and digestibility. So this is the take home message here, you guys. Adding spoiled silage to your ration reduces the entire ration digestibility. You can see this decline right here. This mark right here is what we were just talking about in the previous slide where we've lost 75%. You've got a decrease in dry matter intake and you've got a decrease in digestible ration intake. And what does that mean? That's a loss of two pounds of digestible dry matter that calculates out to a half a pound of milk, or I mean, sorry, a half a pound of beef uh, rate of gain and four to five pounds of milk per day. So you can have five to 20% of dry matter loss before any visible signs of spoilage are present. We already talked about how the average dry matter loss for a pile is 15% with good management. So if we're talking about a pile that doesn't have sil doesn't have plastic on it, we could be up in the high 30s even for overall dry matter loss. Six to 8% of dry matter loss is just gonna happen. It's unavoidable, whether that's from fermentation losses, leach losses, it's impossible to do better than six to 8%. Okay. So that's what I have for you, but I do want to remind you out of all the variables that we talked about, you want to control what you can in order to be more forgiving of those things that the environment's going to throw at you that you can't control. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question actually is a comment about Keith and, and that uh, he will be missed. He was a very good teacher, big impact. And I do have to say that the presentation he gave I guess it's four years ago at, at uh, one of these initial silage conferences was was impactful. I mean, I, I still remember his silage safety message and the things he talked about today. So thank you for that tribute and certainly he, he will be missed. Um, okay, so uh, questions. The first question is um, about piles on bare soil. What kind of preparation, says they might have missed it, but the, the question is what kind of preparations are needed? You compact the soil, you provide drainage. Um, that, that's the basic question. So yeah, you wanna make sure that it's as firm of a base as possible. And you also wanna make sure that you have a little bit of slope to it so that you have an opportunity for some drainage over there, whether it's gonna be drainage that starts with weather or whether it's gonna be effluent loss that the pile is gonna have. You wanna make sure that you have drainage. Um, and then, um, just make sure that it's as, as smooth as it can possibly be so that you're not going to be uh, pushing dirt up in. Now, 
when you're building the pile on this dirt pad, that carpet that I showed you the picture of, I, that, that really is a game changer with regards to how much dirt is gonna end up in the pile, either from tires or from the blade itself. And besides the fact that dirt isn't a nutrient, it also is fermentation inhibitive. So the more dirt that you have in the pile, the more challenge you're giving that pile to ferment and preserve. The next question is an interesting one. Can piles affect buried utility lines? I can't say that I know the answer to that question. Um, it is that the effluent is extremely corrosive. So I would, I, if I was gonna shoot from the hip, I would have to assume that if you have lines buried in an environment where that effluent can reach to, you could have some corrosion, but that's, that's my best shot at an answer for that. Any other questions, please type them into the, the Q&A or into the chat. I guess while we're waiting for people to think of questions, I, I, I guess I'm curious, we have a lot of bunkers here in Iowa um, and, and uh, that issue with the having spoilage along the edge is, is really significant. You mentioned having someone that knows what they're doing when with in terms of packing along the edge of the bunker wall. Uh, any, any, do you have any follow up on that? Any more details on what it takes to really do a good job with that? I like the idea of a, of a bunker burrito too. I'm gonna have to remember that one. Yeah, so that's good, but that's a tough one to get, that's a tough one to get guys to jump onto because um, they don't wanna buy all of that plastic. So your next best, best option is to make sure that above your walls, you have enough slope um, and plastic coverage over this that you don't have your pile shrink beneath your wall like this because when you have your wall right here and you and you have shrink below that this is your area where everything gets in and so you want to try to have your pile high enough if, if it's just walls and it's not um ground on the side of that bunker it's really hard you can't go above that wall um, so it, I, I, it kind of depends on what your walls are, whether you have ground that a tractor can travel on versus concrete walls, like what was shown in that picture. Um, if you only have those concrete walls, I really got to say that plastic is your best option. Okay. Um, so densities for earlage and high moisture corn compared to silage, if you've got that information. As a rule of thumb, for high moisture corn, your density is gonna be between 40 to 50. And when I say between 40 to 50, so five feet from the surface, the top surface, you wanna be 40. And then the farther down, for every five feet that you go down, you wanna have better density pack. The more mass that you have sitting on top, the better density you should have down low. So for, for ear layered or high moisture corn, you're 40 to 50. For corn silage, you're 15 to 20, so 15 at the top, 20 on the bottom. Um, alfalfa silage, 18 at the top to 23 on the bottom. And then snaplage, which would be your earlage, 30 to 40. Excellent, thank you. Oh, here's one more. Is there a question about silo gas poisoning with a silage stack? So silage gas poisoning can be reduced, be produced around any silage environment. So um, whether we're talking about upright silos or drive over piles or bags or bunkers, that gas is being produced. So when a silage pile gets put up, that first two weeks after ensiling is really your critical time. And if there's a lot of gas that's being produced, uh, you can sometimes see it. It's kind of an orangey, brownish kind of cloud floating in the air. Um, look for dead rodents around the silage pile. That's a good indication that you've got some, some gassing off, but it's just a really good rule of thumb to stay away from the silage pile uh, for those first couple of weeks after it's it's been ensiled. Don't be lifting up the plastic to see what happens. Excellent, excellent information. Well, not seeing any more questions, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap this up for today. And we have one more in the webinar series, and that will be Dr. Galen Erickson from the University of Nebraska next week, uh, talking about nutrition aspects of silage feeding in the current economic environment. 
And uh, then UNL will follow this up with some podcasts where we really get into some depth on some of these topics a little bit more. So again, thank you for joining us and we'll look forward to Dan, having you join us next week. Yes, Dan, Dan. I just got one more question in. Um, to avoid uh, muddy, do you see the possibility to use limestone revolved in the soil or incorporated in the soil, I mean? I don't have an, I, I've never experienced that, so I really can't express about that. I could do a little bit of research about that and follow up if you want to shoot me an email. Um, that's just not something that I have experience with. Very good. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you all next week.